Well, hello everybody, Roger here, and welcome to my channel, Roger's Reads. So today we're continuing with our Harry Potter read-along, and we're reading Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, or uh, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, if, if you're reading the UK version. So we started off with chapter three, and this chapter starts out by telling us that because of that boa constrictor incident that we saw in the previous chapter, Harry is locked in his cupboard until summer uh, as punishment. So when he's finally released from the cupboard, he spends as much time away from the house as possible uh, be in order to escape the torments of Dudley and uh, Dudley's gang who uh, really go out of their way to torture Harry. So one day, um, let me look at my notes here. Oh, one day, so one day Uncle Vernon is, tells Harry to fetch the mail, and then there's a letter addressed to Harry, which is addressed to the cupboard under the stairs, uh, which is very strange indeed. So Uncle Vernon grabs the envelope from Harry with it before Harry gets a chance to uh, look at it, and then shows it to uh, Aunt Petunia. And I really love the reactions of both of them on page 35. Who to be writing to you, sneered Uncle Vernon, shaking the letter while open with one hand and glancing at it. His face went to red to green faster than a set of traffic lights, and it didn't stop there. Within seconds, it was grayish white of old porridge. And then there's Aunt Petunia. Aunt Petunia took it curiously and read the first line. For a moment, it looked as though she might faint. She clutched her throat and made a choking noise. So uh, so apparently Uncle Vernon and Aunt Petunia know the contents of the letter, and it shocked them in some way. But uh, they do refuse to give Harry the letter, and they tell Harry to move to Dudley's room uh, instead of the cupboard, which is uh, his, actually it's Dudley's smaller room where he stores all of his toys, or I should say most of them are broken toys that didn't fit in his first room. Um, we kind of get a feeling for how spoiled he is um, on page 37 when they're describing uh, the contents of the room. Nearly everything in here was broken. The month-old video camera was lying on top of a small working tank Dudley had once driven over, to the, over the next-door neighbor's dog. In the corner was Dudley's first ever television set, which he'd put his foot through when his favorite television program had been cancelled. There was a large bird cage which once held a parrot that Dudley had swapped at school for a rear air rifle, which was up on a shelf with the end all bent because Dudley sat on it. So uh, we kind of get an idea for how spoiled he is so to such an extent that he doesn't even take care of, uh, of the things he has. Now, when Harry moves into his room, Dudley pitches an absolute temper tantrum the next morning, um, which, uh, you know, again, once again, shows what a nasty little spoiled brat he was. That was on page 38, the temper tantrum. Next morning at breakfast, everyone was rather quiet. Dudley was in shock. He screamed whacked his father with his smelting stick, been sick on purpose, kicked his mother, and thrown his tortoise through the greenhouse roof, and he still didn't have his room back. So, uh, yeah, so, so really, uh, we really get an idea of uh, <laughs> what a brat Dud uh, Dudley is. So when talking about these letters and the contents of these letters, you know, what really struck me here was the blatant prejudice of the Dursleys exhibit. Much like people who are racist uh, express when they're talking about other people. Um, a good example of that was on th page 36, when uh, Uncle Vernon says, I'm not having one in the house, Petunia. Didn't we swear when we took him in we'd stamp out all that dangerous nonsense? So we're not sure what one in the house means, but it's obviously referring to Harry. So at first, I had kind of a difficult time figuring out the reason behind Dursley's negative reaction. After all, we learn in the next chapter that the letters are actually an invitation for Harry to attend Hogwarts school. 
So given the way that the Dursleys treat Harry and the contempt that they show for him, I figured that they'd be actually happy to get him out of the house. Then it struck me, it was an uppetry bigotry again, which we just saw uh, on page 35. Now, I hadn't thought the possibility that uh, Harry would have to spend summer breaks back at home with the Dursleys, and apparently they did not want a wizard in training in their life or in their house. So regarding these letters, it's also kind of interesting how the Dursleys believe that if they ignore the letters, if they ignore the situation, the whole thing will just go away. And you know, I know, pe I, I know people like this in real life uh, who have this as a philosophy of their life. Just ignore it and hope it'll go away, which doesn't always work very well with uh, illness. So um, that was on page 35, I think we had that example. Petunia starts speaking. What should we do, Vernon? Should we write back? Tell them that we don't want... No, he said finally. We'll ignore it. If they don't get an answer, yes, that's best. We won't do anything, which, uh, which I did get a kick out of it. But, uh, of course, that didn't work very well because the next day another letter comes for Harry, this time addressed to him in the smallest bedroom, which is kind of creepy. So they... Who, so, so, that gives us the impression that somebody is watching and somebody knows that Harry had been moved from the cupboard to the, to the Dursley's smaller bedroom. So, of course, Dursley's are once again shocked. And Harry tries to get the letter, but Uncle Vernon keeps it from him once again. So Harry has a plan. The following morning, he's going to wake up early to try to get the mail before anyone else has a chance to. But he is thwarted by Uncle Vernon, who has spent the night sleeping near the mail slot, as though uh, he'd anticipated what Harry uh, might do. Three letters arrive that day. And we see more another example of bigotry on page 40. Oh, these people's minds work in mysterious ways, Petunia. They're not like you and me. And you know, you see this a lot, again, with racist people talking about other people. They try to dehumanize them. They're not like you and me. Or these people think differently than we do. Or these people are differently, are different than we are. Uh, so, I, so that struck me uh, during reading, reading these chapters, which I found very interesting. So things get real cartoonish like then as Vernon... <laughs> nails out, nails the mail slot shut, nails any cracks in the house, but all in vain because letters continue to find their way in the house. Uh, 12 letters in one day and I do believe 24 the next. So apparently uh, the, the letters are doubling and whatever Vernon is doing isn't working. So soon letters flood the house, uh, entering from the kitchen chimney, um, I think they pour out of the fireplace. And, of course, Uncle Vernon still dashes madly around trying to prevent Harry from reading any of them. So by now, we can see that story is, in, is really stressing Harry's importance, though we're not quite sure yet what it is, and we're not yet aware of the contents of the letters. But somebody is going through a hell of a lot of trouble to get some news to Harry. And given the manner in which the letters are being delivered and how they find them, no matter where they go, which we see in the next chapter, uh, we can presume that there's some sort of supernatural aspect to them. You know, it's kind of fun that actually that uh, Rowling doesn't let us know right away the contents of these letters. So this is an excellent plot device, I think, to build up suspense in the story. So... Ignoring the letters doesn't work, so there's only one thing left to do. <laughs> Run away! Which is exactly what they do. So Uncle Vernon packs up the car and decides to take everyone away from the house. But at the hotel where they stay, more letters find their way to Harry. This time addressed to H. Potter at the hotel where they're staying. So Uncle Vernon's paranoia begins to increase. and He acts like he's being hunted. There was a good example of this on page 43. Exactly what he was looking for 
None of them knew. He drove them into the middle of a forest, got out, looked around, shook his head, got back into the car, and off they went again. The same thing happened in the middle of a ploughed field, halfway across a suspension bridge, and at the top of a multi-level parking garage. So, which is kind of fun. In fact, Dudley even asks at this point, Daddy's gone mad, hasn't he? And so they're on the run once again. And it just so happens that it's a dark and terribly stormy night. Uncle Vernon takes the family out to an island with, a, with only one little crappy shack on it. Inside, Vernon bolts the door. So, uh, so, all, so we have all these interesting elements here. The dark night, the terrible weather, the desolate island, the dilapidated shack, uh, Uncle Vernon's increasing panic and paranoia. Uh, all of this really helps, build, uh, helps to build up the tension in the story. So then we get to the countdown of Harry's 11th birthday. And right at midnight, when Harry turns 11, the chapter ends in a climax with a loud thump at the shack door, exactly at the stroke of midnight. So at the beginning of the chapter, the thump is heard again. But once again, they ignore it. Well, a moment later, a giant smashes down the door. And the giant is someone who we've already met at the end of chapter two. Now, I love it when Uncle Vernon threatens the giant with a gun, but the giant just takes the gun and then ties it into a knot. So the giant enters the cabin and gifts Harry with a birthday cake and then introduces him himself as uh, Rebus Hagrid, the keeper of keys and grounds at Hogwarts. So we as a reader still haven't really learned what Hogwarts is. Now, you know, I remember reading somewhere that the act of Hagrid gifting Harry the birthday cake uh, points to a major transition in the story where it suggests that, that the wizarding world will now provide for Harry instead of the Dursleys and that he will now uh, be, taken care of, be being taken care of properly. So via conversations with Harry... Hagrid is shocked to learn that the Dursties have never told Harry what Hogwarts is or what he is. And uh, this was illustrated on page 49 and 50. So Hagrid says, Do you mean to tell me, he growled at the Dursties, that this boy, this boy, knows nothing about anything? Which... Uh, which Harry kind of <laughs> took umbrage with. He was kind of insulted. He says, well, I know some things. I know I can, you know, do math and stuff. And then uh, on page 50, but Hagrid simply waved his hand and said, about our world. I mean, your world, my world, your parents' world. What world? Hagrid looked as if he were about to explode. Dursley, he boomed. So it's, uh, it's uh, pretty funny. So it's apparent that Hagrid is quite upset that the Dursleys have never clued in Harry on his past. So Vernon tries, uh, Uncle Vernon tries once again to stop Hagrid from telling Harry about Hogwarts. But Hagrid frightens him into silence. It's interesting that the Dursleys have all along been aware of the wizarding world, but have chosen instead to live in denial, following uh, that philosophy of, if you pretend it's not there, then it will go away, or if you pretend it's not there, it doesn't exist, which we've already seen uh, in, pra in the past with the Dursleys. It seems to be, <laughs> there seems to be a philosophy that they live their lives by. And now uh, this is especially true with embarrassing facts or situations. By uh, pretending that they don't exist, they can carry on with their own lives, of course, until it comes crashing down upon them, much like the door in the shack. So maybe that door in the shack was symbolic of the Dursley's uh, denial crashing down on them. So then Hagrid tells Harry that Harry is a wizard and presents him with his letter of acceptance into the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry signed by Minerva McGonagall. And, uh, and those of us who know the story are aware that Minerva McGonagall, Professor McGonagall, plays an important role in the story as the books progress. 
So Vernon once again finds his courage and exclaims that he will not allow Harry to attend Hogwarts, only to be silenced once again by Hagrid. So we also once again see the usage of the word muggle, and it's not used in a very positive light this time. So in this way, we begin to see a negative connotation associated with this word. I was on page 53. He's not going, he said. And this is Vernon speaking. Hagrid grunted. I'd like to see a great muggle like you stop him, he said. A what? said Harry, interested. A muggle, said Hagrid. It's what we call non-magic folk like them. And it's your bad luck you grew up in a family of the biggest muggles I ever laid eyes on. So, so we definitely see a more negative connotation with this word. And it seems that bigotry works both ways in this book. What I find interesting is how that social world, that world of keeping up appearances come for the, that the Dursleys work so hard to build up, uh, comes crashing down in this chapter when the power struggle between Dursley and uh, Hagrid, uh, if you can even call it a power struggle, uh, ends up knocking Vernon right off his pedestal. This is especially evident when Hagrid bends uh, Vernon's gun that we mentioned, illustrating that Verlin, Vernon has lost his power in this situation, because we often associate guns and weapons with power. Usually, he who has the weapon has the power. So Hagrid then tells Harry that the Dursleys have been lying to him all along about Harry's parents, and that they did not die in a car crash as Harry had always believed, but were actually killed by an evil wizard named Voldemort, though nobody ever refers to him by his actual name. It's interesting to note, it's interesting to note that though Voldemort is supposedly gone, People are still frightened uh, of him. And we see this on page 54 and 55, I believe. Yes, 54 and 55. Who? And it was Harry who was asking. Well, I don't like saying the name if I can help it. No one does. Why not? Gulping gargoyles, Harry. People are still scared. So we see that people are still afraid of Voldemort. And he goes on to say, Nah... I can't spell it. All right. Voldemort. Hagrid shuddered. Don't make me say it again. So we see even Hagrid, the big giant Hagrid, is fearful of even saying the wizard's name. So Harry initially does not believe that he's a wizard at all. But then through Hagrid's pushing, Harry does start to realize slowly that weird stuff has indeed been happening all along. And strangely, what Hagrid is saying begins to make sense to Harry. We also learn that Harry is going to be at Hogwarts for seven years, which I find interesting, which, because this ended up being the number of books, that uh, the number of Harry Potter books that we ended up with. So I wonder if Rowling has seven books planned out already at this uh, early stage. So anyway, despite Uncle Vernon's protests, Hagrid takes Harry from the shack, and then the fun begins. Oh, is, oh, you know, I also found it interesting to learn that Hagrid was expelled from Hogwarts. For some reason, I don't remember that fact. And I'm not sure if we ever do learn the reason why. So I'm kind of uh, excited to go through the books to learn if we ever do uh, discover why Hagrid was expelled from Hogwarts. Um, like I mentioned, it's been a while since I read the series, so I don't remember all the little details. Chapter 5. Harry and Hagrid set off to London to shop for Harry's school supplies. So Harry learns through their conversation that his parents left behind plenty of money for, uh, for Harry, but is stored at a wizard's bank run by goblins called Gringotts. But before heading to the bank, they first stop off at the Leaky, Leaky Cauldron, uh, a pub which, by the way, has a recurring place in the story, uh, as we see in many books down the road. So at the pub, all of the patrons immediately recognize Harry, probably because of the uh, lightning scar on his uh, forehead, and to act honored to meet him. So Henry spends the next several minutes shaking hands with everybody uh, who's swooning around him. 
So during Harry and Hagrid's conversation here, we learned some interesting tidbits. We learned about the Ministry of Magic. Uh, and we also learned about uh, Cornelius Fudge, who is the head of the Ministry of Magic. And, and uh, we went into him later on. We also learned about Hagrid's love for Fantastic Beasts when uh, he speaks about how much he'd love to have a real dragon. So speaking of Fantastic Beasts, I really got a chuckle when I noticed that uh, one of Harry's required school books was entitled Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, written by none other than Newt Scamander. So uh, that was a, that's a fun movie if you haven't seen it yet. Um, and actually, the sequel to the movie is coming out this November, I believe. But I digress. So, Harry and Hagrid head out to the street where Hagrid taps on a brick wall and a small street called Diagon Alley opens up before them, which is a, kind of a wizard's shopping area. So this is the first time in the book that the real magical world opens up to Harry. So first they go to Gringotts where they are escorted down to Harry's uh, vault or safe. And uh, once inside, they see the piles of silver and gold that Harry's uh, parents left him. So Hagrid then explains the wizard monetary system, which is composed of galleons, sickles, and uh, canuts. That was on page uh, 75, <laughs> which, uh, which is interesting. Hagrid helped Harry pile some of it into a bag. The gold ones are galleons, he explained. Seventeen silver sickles to a galleon, and 29 canuts to a sickle. So that's the wizard uh, monetary system. So we learn here that the wizarding world is pretty much a mirror of our own consumerist world uh, in regards to economics, uh, complete with uh, banks and shops and requiring money to obtain anything. So it certainly isn't a cash-free paradise that we might uh, expect um, in a magical world. So apparently people just cannot conjure up anything, <laughs> anything they like. So Hagrid then takes Harry to be uh, fitted for his school uniform. And in the store, he encounters a snobbish and rather unlikable boy who will also be starting at Hogwarts this fall. Now, those of us who are familiar with the books can pretty much figure out who this uppity, uh, uppity boy is. So anyway, the boy talks very highly of the grand old wizard families and states how Hogwarts should not allow wizards born to muggle families in to Hog into the school. So once again, here we see bigotry at work. Uh, apparently it's alive and well in the wizarding world as well as in the human world. So this is something that Harry apparently cannot get away from. So maybe we begin to think that his life at Hogwarts is not going to be all that different from his life in the real world. That there's definitely going to be trials, tribulations, and bigotry that he's going to have to encounter there as well. Apparently, the two worlds may not be so different after all, as there appears to be snobbery and bigotry in both. But Hagrid does reassure Harry, telling him that there are many muggle students at Hogwarts. So after buying his school books and school supplies, uh, Hagrid and Harry then head off to the wand store and meet Mr. Ollivander, the store owner. So the store owner clearly remembers the wands that he once sold to Harry's parents and tells Harry all about them. Details which give Harry a more concrete connection to her parents, her parents that he never knew. So at the store, Harry tries out a number of different magic wands, uh, with the shopkeeper telling him that it will be clear when he's chosen the right wand, because after all, the wand chooses the wizard. The wizard doesn't choose the wand. So Harry finally picks up one made of a holly and phoenix feathers and when he does sparks shoot out the end of it so this is clearly the right wand so what's interesting is about this wand is that all of olivander tells harry that the only other wand containing feathers from the same phoenix belongs to da -da -da -dun, Voldemort. And that particular wand, Voldemort's wand, had been used in giving Harry the lightning bolt scar, uh, forehead scar, when uh, Voldemort attempted to kill him. 
So in this way, uh, though the two wands are brothers. We also here in this scene see another name mentioned for Voldemort. Uh, the shopkeeper refers to him as he who must not be named. So it's the first time that he's been referred to the referred to by this uh, in this in this manner. So far we have, of course, his regular name Voldemort, which nobody dares say. There's you know who, and now he who must not be named. Um, and the last one, he who must not be named, almost has a, has a little bit more respect to it than the uh, the previous one, you know who. So the fact that Harry and Voldemort's one contains a phoenix feather from the same phoenix. It might be kind of a foreshadowing that Harry and Voldemort may end up being equals, because after all, the ones are brothers. At the very least, this information can lead us to believe that it's quite likely that their paths are going to cross in the future, or maybe Harry will become evil like Voldemort. So anyway, Harry ends up getting the creeps from uh, the shopkeeper, Ollivander, and, uh, who says that Voldemort did great things. That was on page 87. I can't remember how he exactly phrased it. Well, that's not on 87. No, it's on 80, 85, actually. Yes, 13 and a half inches. You... Curious how these things happen. The wand chooses the wizard, remember. I think we're going to expect great things from you, Mr. Potter. After all, he who must not be named did great things. Terrible, yes, but great. So, uh, and this, this, this kind of gives Harry the creeps. So, we end the chapter. And I have to say, I was kind of sad to see that at the end of this section... Harry has to return to the Dursleys until September 1st when the school year begins at Hogwarts. Hogwarts. So I'm guessing that based on the incidents which occurred at the shack with Hagrid and uh, Vernon, uh, I'm guessing that life is not going to be very pleasant for Harry in the coming days. And uh, I will see that in the next chapter, I'm sure. So... That is the end of our reading for this time. Um, what did you think of the uh, these these three chapters? Was there anything that particularly jumped out at you? Anything you liked, disliked? Any interesting themes that you picked up on? Uh, if so, let me know in the comments. So for next week, we will read the next three chapters, which would be six, seven, and eight, and that'll be for next Sunday. Um, oh, I just want to let everybody know that I am. I'm going to have an unexpected surgery uh, coming up next week. So I'm going to be out of pocket for about a week or so, I think, I hopefully. Uh, but I'm going to record next week's video ahead of time. So if I don't answer in the comments right away, uh, you know, bear with me. Give me a couple of days and I'll get to them. Okay, and that's it for this time for uh, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. I will talk to you in the next video. Bye-bye.